Welcome to episode 277 of The Brainy Business, Understanding the Psychology of Why People Buy. In today's episode, I'm excited to introduce you to John Sills, author of The Human Experience. Ready? Let's get started. You are listening to The Brainy Business Podcast, where we dig into the psychology of why people buy and help you incorporate behavioral economics into your business, making it more brain friendly. Now here's your host, Melina Palmer. Hello, hello, everyone. My name is Melina Palmer, and I want to welcome you to the Brainy Business Podcast. In today's conversation, I'm joined by John Sills. John is managing partner at the customer-led growth company, The Foundation. 25 years ago, he started his career on a market stall in Essex, and since then has worked in and with companies around the world to make things better for customers. He's been in frontline teams delivering the experience, innovation teams designing the propositions, and global HQ teams creating the strategy. He's been a bank manager during the financial crisis, which he notes is not fun, launched a mobile app to millions of people, which he says was very fun, and regularly visits strangers' houses to ask very personal questions, which he finds to be incredibly fun. He now works with companies across industries and around the world, and before joining the foundation, spent 12 years at HSBC, latterly as head of customer innovation. He regularly writes on customer experience and innovation, and his first book, The Human Experience, just came out and is what we're discussing today. This was a really fun book, and it's chock full of real life experiences from businesses, both good and bad, that you can learn from. John keeps it light, even when teaching some really important stuff, and helps us to see how we can all benefit from remembering that we are, at the end of the day, humans, and so are our employees and customers. So let's just bring a bit more humanness back into our companies. Really quickly, before we get into the conversation, I want to be sure you know that there are links in the show notes for everything, including related past episodes, links to articles and books, including the human experience, and so much more. It's all within the app you're listening to and at thebrainybusiness.com slash 277. Now let's jump right in. John Sills, welcome to the Brainy Business Podcast. Thanks, man. Really good to be here. Thanks for having me on. Oh, yeah. I'm I'm very excited to have the conversation. I found your book to be very, very interesting, very fun read as we're going through it. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about it and things leading into it. Like we said in this sort of pre-talk, we're going to just see especially more than I feel like any person I've had on. This is going to be the like, see where the conversation takes us. I can tell this is going to be a fun chat no matter what, and we're going to just sort of see where we go. But for everyone who doesn't yet know you, can you share a little bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, I can. You're one of the first people to read it in full as well. That isn't uh, my isn't my wife or other people that I know are going to say it's good. So um, I'm really, really pleased that you, you enjoyed it. Yeah, so I'm, I'm John Seals. So I'm based in London. I'm a managing partner at an organization called The Foundation, and we uh, help organizations to become customer-led and really understand what matters to their customers. But I've worked in customer experience for 25 years, uh, from starting on a market stall in Essex in the UK, earning a pound an hour, selling haberdashery. Uh, I went to work for HSBC for a number of years, running branches and working in the front line. And I went to head office and looked after their global customer experience there before joining the foundation about eight years ago. And we're, we're a pretty independent consultancy. So my whole background and, and uh, adult life, I guess, has always had this customer thread right the way through the middle of it. Yeah. i um not sure if you, you know that my background, I also spent time uh, in banking, you know, the greater banking space uh, and was credit unions and banks are a little bit different, but still um, it's a... It's definitely a space of where there every industry has their um, whether it's like the commoditization of issues or where you're, you have enough people like you and that the industry has been around for a long time and you look around and say, well, this is how this is how people do things, right? That herding mentality is really strong, and so you you know talk about things like 
APYs and APRs and assume that people know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's I find it fascinating in banking. I mean, I've always I was always interested in. Um, it sounds awful. I was always interested in money uh, more than banking. I was interested in how people behaved with money and the decisions that they made. But you're, you're right. As I worked more in the banking industry, I got more interested in you know these big kind of organisations that are just so successful in terms of their finances and you're really trying to get them to become more customer led and do things that are better for customers but there is a question we kind of go well why you know why should they because they're making 10 billion pound profit a year and it's quite interesting to be in that environment where it's full of good people that want to do good things but somehow the companies and the industries still don't seem to be able to turn to be to be customer led And, and i think it was a good a good lesson for you really need to want to do this. You really need to want to make things better for customers because you're right in those kind of organizations, it's so easy not to. And then it's so easy because you're so surrounded by the industry and the regulations and the rules and you're so distant from your customers and you're so distant from uh, what people really know and understand about money. It then becomes so hard to create products that are just simple to use and easy to understand. I guess it's a version of the curse of knowledge that, you would have, have talked about, I'm sure, many times before. Yeah, no, I was definitely just thinking about and uh, thinking, I'm going to write a note about Curse of Knowledge and then we can talk about it. So there is an episode on the Curse of Knowledge, but for anyone who, you know, isn't familiar, and I think in this case, um, you know, when you, there are two kind of sides of it that I talk about. There's the piece with your staff, with your team's employees in Curse of Knowledge. So you bring in a new person. And that was more um, how I talked about it in the episode because it's in my second book, What Your Employees Need and Can't Tell You. I'm talking about that. But then, like you're saying, on this customer side is really important as well in that we assume that people know so much more about the industry we're in or what it is that we're working on or um, what all the competitors are doing and what the pricing structures are, what our costs are. Like you, we yeah, yeah. think people know so much and they super don't. They really don't know. <laughs> well, they, they, they really don't. And it, and it gets... I think it's interesting. I mean, there's already about three tangents we could go off here, I think, but you know, it's interesting just around how we how we see the world. You know, we talk a lot about, and I talk in the book about um, inside out thinking and outside in thinking and being able to step out of your own environment and see the world from other people's perspectives. And there's an exercise I ask people to do in the book, which is just to go and draw a map of the world, just as you would see in an atlas, just go and draw a map of the world. And, and something really interesting happens when you ask people to do that in that, uh, depending on where they are, they always draw the map in the same way. So if you're in the UK, uh, nearly everyone will draw the UK bang in the middle of the map. And they'll often draw the UK much bigger than it really is. Um, and if you're in America, you'll often draw America more in the middle and America bigger than it really is. And when you get, you know, you'll get the bits closer to you, right? So, you know, you'll get, you know, America, Canada, Mexico, South America. And you probably remember Hawaii and Florida and Cuba. Um, and in the UK, that's the same. We get Spain and Italy and Ireland. And then when you get further out, you know, when you get to kind of Africa, it just becomes a triangle and Asia just becomes a circle and everybody forgets Japan. Like everybody forgets Japan because it's just a very long way away. And it's, it's really an example of how organizations work because you're, you're just, you're closer to, you know, your own colleagues and your own business and your own products and your own services and your own regulator. And your customers are a bit like Japan. They're really big and important and you know they're there. But there's all these layers, literal layers sometimes, between you and them and, and, and what really what really matters to them. And then that's when it becomes so easy to, uh, particularly around language and jargon, to, to your point, to write things in a way that makes sense to you but just doesn't make sense to anyone else. So I got sent a text message from my bank recently and it said, um, uh, you are you've gone into your arranged overdraft but you don't have an arranged overdraft limit and if you don't get out of your arranged overdraft limit then you'll be charged an unarranged overdraft fee and i've worked in a bank for 12 years and i had no idea what that meant but you know the person that wrote it knows what that means but i don't know what that means and it happens so naturally right and yeah I can gather, again, from years in the space, like, I think, I'm pretty sure I know what they're trying to say, but yikes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is yeah. not even close. And, uh, of course, to all of our listeners in Japan, please know that you are very big and important uh, as 
as John said, and we care about you. Uh, I would be interested to see for, um, you know, all the listeners, you know, from everywhere, right? To see, you know, I know there are a lot of listeners in South Africa. There are a lot, like, what do those maps look like? And then to see how it kind of, it'll always blur out, like you said, at the edges. There's, I'm reminded of an episode of Friends where they talk about that you can't remember all 50 states. And they have, I forget, it's like, you know, 10 minutes or maybe it's an hour or something, but it says like, if you don't know them by now, you're not going to know what they are and that Ross can't get, you know, and then he chooses not to eat dinner at Thanksgiving until he can find them and, and this whole thing. And, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you get, I think Friends has almost got a life lesson for everything in it, hasn't it? But I mean, you're right, actually. Just on that, I, you know, we work with clients around the world and we were working with a team in Hong Kong not too long ago and we did the map of the world exercise. And exactly as you say, you know, this guy drew his map of Hong Kong with a bit of China. He had Japan, he had Singapore, he had Indonesia. And he, he didn't even, he didn't even bother <laughs> to draw the other, he didn't even bother to draw Europe or America. It just wasn't part of his map. It was, it was just fascinating. And uh, in fact, I read there was, um, there's a brilliant book you, you, you may have heard of called Factfulness by Hans Rosling, who is that amazing, sadly no longer with us, but that amazing Ted talk speaker who, who runs the company Gapminder. Um, Factfulness is all about helping us challenge our perceptions of, of the world. And there's a really interesting point in that that says, um, you know, remember, it's something like uh, five sixths of every person that's alive in the world is in Southeast Asia, Asia and Southeast Asia, so India, China, and coming into Indonesia. And he says, so remember, uh, over half of everything that happens every day happens in that part of Asia. And I just found that such an important, a brilliant point, but such an important thing to remember because it's so easy for us to think we're the center of the world and us in Europe or in America or anywhere, then you go, come here, more than half of everything that's happening every day is just on the other side of the world. And I have no idea about it. And it's yeah, just brilliant. And bringing it back to business, it's brilliant to, to be aware of your limitations of perception because they are natural limitations and then deliberate, make deliberate choices to do something about that, to shift yourself outside of your own comfort zone and your own perception to really understand what matters to your customers, not their opinions of your service, but what matters to them in their lives. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so when you were talking about the, so the exercise of drawing the map, the inside out, outside in, um, you know, what are the kind of next steps in the process? So we've had our mental exercise in that process and can see how like, yeah, I know what my, my map would look like the maps you're talking about, but uh, so, yeah. so what kind of comes next for what's the point of that? Yeah, that's right. So, so in, um, I feel like I keep saying in the book, but in the book. Yeah, that's uh, good. It's, yeah. That's good. <laughs> it's the time to talk about in, in the, you can also say in the human experience. In the human experience <laughs> out in America on the 4th of April. And yeah. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. So, so, so we talk about, I start by talking about these three myths, actually, these three myths that I think exist that get in the way of organizations delivering a real human experience for their customers at the moment. And one of those in this, the map of the world exercise directly links to this is about the myth of customer feedback. Um, and, uh, you know, this belief that leaders in organizations have got that they're close to their customers because of the amount of customer data they currently have in organizations. And there's never been more customer data than there is now in organizations. You know, you've got a huge amount of data about what customers are doing and on social media and searching for. But also all of these feedback surveys, all of these NPS surveys that are coming in. And the problem with that is we, we're kind of living in an epidemic of feedback uh, surveys. You know, you, as a customer, you can't have any experience now without immediately being asked, what did you think about it? <laughs> what did you think about our experience? But the problem with that, to this point about outside in, is nearly all of that research is very inside out. It's very arrogant, actually. It's all about the company. It's what do you think about us? What do you think about our service? What do you think about our product? Would you recommend this? And almost none of it is, tell us about you. Tell us about your life. Tell us about what matters to you and what's important to you right now. And then we can help work out how to be useful to you. And I call this the, the, the thick and the thin end of the wedge. You know, the, the customer's life is a bit like this wedge that it starts with all that big stuff at the top of them and their lives and their family and their job and their ambitions and their hopes, the challenges, the things that get in the way, the services they use to help. And then at the end of that, the tiny little bit at the end of the wedge is your business and your role in their, in their life. But 99% of all of that feedback, all of those feedback surveys are at that thin end of the wedge. And as I say, that kind of creates this illusion of 
leaders being close to customers and they're really not. And what was interesting when I went to study the the companies I studied when I was looking at the uh, at the story of the book and, and the companies that do give this human experience, one of the traits they had, the ways of working, I called them enablers, was real customer connection, like being really, really connected to what matter to their customers. And that meant spending real time with their customers, you know, in their houses, going shopping with them. You know, there's one of the railway lines, uh, Chilton Railways in, in the UK, one of the rail companies, their senior managers have to live on that rail route. So they have to get their own trains in and out of work every day. And they have to wear their name badges when they're on the train. So they're experiencing what their customers are experiencing, but they're also getting unfiltered feedback every every single day. Um, you know, really, you know, City Mapper do, do the same. Um, whenever City Mapper move into a new city, they have this thing called the traveling circus. They get a team of people, a cross section of people that work for City Mapper. They move them to the city for a month. And every two days, they move around Airbnb. So they move to a different part of the city. So they get into experience life commuting in that city. And, and that's what these companies do. They really stay close to what matters to their customers in their lives, then work out how to be useful to them. And that's the outside in view of the world. That's the Japan view of the world, as opposed to just getting loads and loads of feedback surveys and NPS that kind of just gives you an average score from the people that can be bothered to reply, but doesn't actually help you create something brilliant or trailblaze on, on customers' behalf. Right. I love all of that. And so ages ago, I worked at an airline and I remember that the CEO at the time, uh, and this was before, and you never know what shows have been out in the world. There's some benefit of the U.S. knowing that a lot of our shows, you know, make it out. But so Undercover Boss, are you familiar with? Yeah. 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 And so this was before Undercover Boss as a thing. But I know that the CEO used to go and he would come in and work all the jobs. So the like customer service, when your bags are lost and you have to go and yell at somebody about <laughs> it not being yeah, there, yeah. Uh, you know, he, he went and did that for two days or whatever, and then went and, you know, worked in the call center and, but it wasn't like, hi, I'm the CEO and I'm here to help you. Right. It was just yeah, a guy, yeah. you know, that was yeah. there to be a part of that. And I always thought that was so interesting and such a really cool approach and something you just don't see enough. It's really interesting. And I think it's, it's actually quite a serious point. I, I, I suppose I tried to, I tried to make this early on in the book about actually a lot of this is, is quite an ethical consideration about how you want to treat people. And, you know, I had an experience recently with one of the airlines where, um, you know, I got to the bit where you kind of got to the gate, board the airline, and I had that thing where the person uh, looks at your bag and says, oh, we're going to have to put that in the hold rather than you carrying it on. And I get a bit annoyed because of that. And um, this, this lady was who was uh, working at the gate, she was the person having to go around and get these bags from everyone. And everyone was being so rude to her and so angry about it, really frustrated. And and I got chatting to her because I'm kind of professionally interested and uh, and it was easy. And I said, well, why, why are EasyJet doing this? And she said, well, you'll have to ask EasyJet. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, I work for the airport. She said, EasyJet, give us the rules. And uh, they give me the job to tell everyone that I can't, that the bags can't go on. And then I get all the stick. And I said, well, don't, don't the easy, because the plane is literally like, it's a small airport. It's just, you know, 20 meters away. And I said, well, don't they ever come in or help you? And she said, no, no, no. They stay on the plane. No one from EasyJet has come to speak to me in over eight months. I just have to stand here and take all this abuse from customers. And then you get on the plane. And this is what happened when we got on the plane. It was like a different world. The cabin crew was so friendly and so lovely. And it was a great experience, so different. But all I could think about was this lady in the airport that essentially was being paid to be a bit of a battering ram. And it made me think of a lot of social media managers now. That it's almost like those social media managers effectively are now just employed just to be the, the first place for everyone to take out their anger because you get angry about a customer experience. So you just kind of hammer it on your keyboard to social media or you message someone or you web chat someone. And that's where you get out all your anger. And that's kind of what they're paid for to be these battering rams. And actually the, the senior execs, the people that really need to hear it, are just really hidden away from it. And so they get this different perception of what the customer experience is just based on, you know, it almost happened with the cabin crew. But if you don't go and have that experience, if you don't go and have that experience that yourself, then you're never going to get that visceral connection with what 
it's really mattering to your customers. Uh, and it's a, it does need to be that really immersive, visceral connection to feel the emotion uh, that your customers are feeling or that your colleagues are feeling having to deal with those customers. And it's only then you get the, the, the conviction, I think, and the belief to go and make changes as opposed to just accepting what you currently do. Yeah, it's definitely uh, interesting. And uh, when Jennifer Kleinhens was on the show, she uh, wrote a great book called Choice Hacking and uh, was talking about, we talked about the peak end rule and how the big a big issue for most companies is they don't know where the true end of their experience is. And so she was talking about how, you know, she was ordering and I think it was Lululemon and that it was loves the the brand and the company, but whomever they choose to ship it can never find the house. They always say that they attempted to drop it off, but she's there and they definitely didn't. And it's this really bad experience. But, you know, the company thinks like we did our job. We got it on the truck and like, bye, we're done. Right. They, yeah, and yeah. we did a great job. But this piece, too, of any area where you're outsourcing and, you know, that lady is you know was pleasant enough even where people are yelling at her and it is it's amazing having worked in a call center uh so at the airline i started off working in the call center and man if you think people are rude <laughs> when yeah. they're face to face with you yeah. <laughs> like you said social media is one too and ha- being the head of a marketing department those really aggressive. I was the one that got to take all those. <laughs> that was part of my job that um, I guess now I, I do that for my own company, but I don't really get a lot of those, thankfully. Knock on like all the things, right? I'll knock on all the wood that I don't get a lot of those. Um, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I always try to remember it's a real person that's there, right? Definitely, definitely. Do you know, I um, just two things that reminded me of. One, one was when I was in the, uh, in the, when I was a branch manager, for, for the, the bank I was at, um, <clears throat> probably going back about 15 years, we did a um, uh, a charity fancy dress day and I, I was dressed up as a cowboy. Uh, so I had like these plastic guns in holsters and I had boots and I had the hat. And I remember this customer coming in really angry and saying, I want to speak to the manager. And, and I thought, well, that, that's me. Uh, and so I, <laughs> I kind of had to, and I thought, well, I've got, I can't get changed. He was really anxious. I had to kind of walk out in my cowboy outfit and he was kind of looking at me up and down. I was like, okay, come this way. And we kind of went into the room and I sat down. I had to like take my guns out of the holsters and I like put them on the desk. <laughs> and and he, to be fair to him, he couldn't, he just cracked up laughing. He was like, this is so ridiculous. Like, I'm so sorry. I'm really so sorry. But it was, it was so, it was so, it just really broke, broke the tension. Um, but the, the other thing I was, I was going to say, I think, the thing you've touched on, I think, is really important, which is about ownership. And and actually, I think this is probably one of the biggest things that is missing in organizations at the moment, a real sense of responsibility and ownership for the customer's experience. It feels like a lot of organizations are always trying to find a way out or find someone else to blame or, you know, use the terms and conditions as a, as a way out. Um, and actually, one of, the, one of the best, I'll try and be positive, one of the best customer experiences I've had in the past two or three years with, with uh, Swiss rails. So I was lucky enough to be in Switzerland just before the COVID pandemic uh, uh, started in, in Europe. And my friends, one of my friends was Swiss and she told me about how amazing the Swiss rail network is, the Swiss Federal Rail, and it always runs on time. So I was with a group of 80, uh, 30 octogenarians. So I was, it was with a travel tour with a travel company I was working with, so lots of people in their 80s. Uh, so a big tour group and, and we got on the train to Zurich and the train broke down and I was delighted. So I thought I can WhatsApp my friend and say, you know, you're, you're just, where's Swiss rails rubbish. And, um, and then something amazing happened. So the, 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 the rail guard came straight down within like two minutes because he knew we were a big tour group. And he said, okay, this is what's happened. We're probably going to be here for about 20 minutes. You're probably going to miss your connection in Zurich, but don't worry. I'll come back before you get there and I'll tell you exactly what we're going to do. And then a few minutes later, we had a phone call from the head of operations from Swiss Rail saying, I'm really sorry to hear about what's happened. I know you're a tour group. You need to get to where you're going. Just to let you know, give me a call. This is my number if you need anything. Train manager comes back about 10 minutes later and he says, right, we're just about to start to set off again. You have missed your connection, but this is the next train you need to get. This is the platform. It's going to go from Zurich train station and I'll have someone there to meet you to make sure you get on the train. 
And lo and behold, we pull into Zurich. There's someone at the door of the carriage ready to meet us with a kind of sign for us, walks us round Zurich station to the train that's waiting for us, where they've already reserved us a carriage because we had a carriage reserved on the original train, already reserved as a carriage. And then as we got on, gave us all tea and coffee vouchers for the inconvenience. And in the end, we only got into our final destination about 15 minutes late. Now, I'm not as familiar in the US. If I get to my destination 15 minutes late in the UK, I'm delighted. And that is a good day. That is a good commute. <laughs> and, and I just couldn't believe that they were, they were so responsible for the outcome. Like the outcome was we're going to get you to your destination and we're going to make sure we do everything we can to help you get there. There was no, well, sorry, the train's late. Sort yourself out. Go on your app, find out what time the train is. It, and all it was was pride and ambition to want to give a great experience and then real ownership for us as their customers and delivering what they said they were going to deliver. It was a brilliant experience, but it's something that, stands out as brilliant because I think it's quite rare now. Yeah. Um, as you said, there's the, like, I have three or four different ways I feel like I could ask the question. And so we have kind of the, perhaps, I, I do choose your own adventure questions a lot. So I'm going to say some things and you can choose how you, <laughs> how we go. But I mean, I guess the biggest thing is, so one, I feel like there are companies that would say, yeah, I get that, but... Like that's too expensive. That's too time consuming. How could we be? We don't need to plan for these things that are going to go like when it goes wrong and what up and what about all the other things? And there's so much backlog of bad stuff. Right. So there's that side of, you know, you how could we be expected to do that? And like that's a, a one off example. Right. Um, and then also kind of, I guess, the sad state of, you know, with with something like the railway like why would they when they're the the option right that's that's what's really fascinating about that is that they don't have to do that because you know this is how you're traveling and i think that's a mindset that a lot of people have which gets into i did want to ask you about uh, the myth of customer loyalty because i think that is such a big one too and i could say more things but we'll just sort of leave it there and you can <laughs> that's yeah. enough questions yeah, yeah. for sure <laughs> yeah brilliant well let, let me let me take both of those on maybe separately so because i think the first one talks about the third myth i talk about in the book actually which is about the myth of return of investment um it's a brilliant point. Ultimately, I really believe the bad customer experience is just really expensive to provide. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I give an example on the um, really silly example. I bought, had to buy a bow tie for our Christmas party last year. I didn't want to because I've always worn clip-ons and I got bullied into wearing a proper one by the team here. So I was like, okay, I'll buy one, but quite short notice. And I had to learn how to do it up in two days as well. So uh, I bought it and I got it next day delivery. And the next day, that thing happened where the driver turns up outside your house, looks at your house, basically waves at you and then drives off. And then you get an email that says, oh, sorry, you weren't in. So I was pretty annoyed. Pretty annoyed. So I rang up the company that I bought it through and they said, oh, I'm sorry, call volume is really high at the moment. There might be a bit of a wait. So I was on the phone for about 30 minutes. And uh, when I eventually got through, I said, look, I need this delivered tomorrow, but also can I get the next day, I paid extra for next day, like £7.50, so can I get that refunded uh, because it hasn't turned up next day? And also like, I've been on the phone to you for like an hour now, so could you do something about that? And what followed, I won't, <laughs> I'll spare you all the details, but over the next half hour, ended up having this conversation where we were essentially negotiating over £3. Mm. Originally, she said, well, I'll, I'll give you a fiver back as a gift voucher. I said, well, no, because that's not enough money. And also, you don't sell anything for a fiver, so I'm going to have to spend more money with you. And then she had to go and ask her manager, and then that happened twice. And eventually, we settled on like £10 cash. It was so ridiculous. It took over an hour of my time. But no wonder they've got lots of calls waiting. Because every single yeah, – that, that shouldn't have even been a call. What should have happened is they just automatically refund me the money when they realize it hasn't – been delivered next day as it was meant to and then i don't even have to call at all let alone kind of an hour call so that, i think that happens a lot this kind of myth is that you have to prove the, the the return and investment on customer experience initiatives whereas bad customer experience causes a lot of failure demand which is this concept that vanguard consulting talk about causes a lot of repeat calls a lot of repeat contact if you get a good experience in the first place your customers will contact you less and everything will be will be more efficient on the on the loyalty side. Ooh, really uh, quickly, because yeah, yeah. you mentioned failure demand and 
I think some people know about it. I think a lot of people don't. And it's really, really important to think. I just think the uh, like we, you and I had said leading into the conversation, uh, there's a lot of behavioral science. We're talking about human people and experiences, even though we're not pulling in tons and tons of terms, a couple. Uh, but this reframe uh, it's it. This is all just, I think, a big experience in reframing our perspective on stuff, right? But failure demand, I think, is something a lot of people don't think about enough and don't even realize is a thing. So, can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you're right; it is it is reframing. But essentially, failure demand is the demand that's put on your service or your organization as a result of failures you've made elsewhere in your customer experience or service. So, the best example being someone phones up your contact center to speak to you. They're not happy with the answer that they've been given, so they phone up again. And there was one client we worked with recently, and we found that 33% of all the phone calls that they were having into their contact center were people phoning up again the same day because they weren't happy with the answer they'd been given the first time. And the reason they weren't happy is because that contact center was being measured on average call handling time. Everyone was incentivized to get the customers off the phone within five minutes. And they were doing that brilliantly. Nearly all the calls were See, finished click, in under five goodbye. minutes. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, just like, is that all? Okay, gone. But then the customer would just phone up again. So the customer would spend maybe 15, 20 minutes on the phone that day, but across four different calls, which is hugely, hugely inefficient. And, and it happens all the time. So yeah, that's failure demand. And you see it particularly in... Uh, if, you know, there's poor experiences with apps or on websites and people have to phone because they're not able to do the thing they wanted to do. That just causes this failure demand. Create a great experience in the first place. All of that goes away. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, I'm definitely going to be linking to, I already had a note to do so, but my conversation with Richard Chataway when he was on the show, which has been far too long since I talked with him, but uh, we talk about some call center experience, a different sort of reframe of reducing call time by telling people to take their time, which is really fascinating also in a banking example. So we won't dig into that, but it will be linked in the show notes for everyone. And now you can answer the other question that I asked, yeah, I don't know, 10 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to delay it by another 10 seconds just okay. to say on the, con on the contact center uh, I did once try and persuade an organization to change their kind of call waiting time to humans lives wasted so if you counted up all the minutes that people spent on hold to you during a year and converted that into human lives I thought that would be quite impactful but <laughs> did you hear how did you hear how it worked out for them did yeah, it change they didn't, they they didn't have the bottle to do it. They didn't do it in the end, but I still want someone to do that. I think it would be it. Uh, fascinating and horrifying. Um, yeah, so, so the myth of loyalty. So I, I, I really get quite quite annoyed with customer loyalty and people talking about customer loyalty um, because I think it's quite a dangerous thing. I just don't think it exists. I just don't think it exists. I think as humans, we're loyal to very few things, truly loyal to very few things. That tends to be family and friends maybe sports teams, things that have a very deep emotional connection with us, uh, who we are as people, maybe some places. Um, but very, very rarely are we truly loyal to companies. And there's a really easy test for this. If you think of a company that you think you're loyal to and then say, okay, if they doubled their prices overnight, would you still shop with them? And you might say, yeah, okay, I might. And then if you say, okay, if they doubled their prices, but the quality reduced by half, would you still shop with them? And most people at that point would go, probably not. And you can just go another level if you tripled it and they reduced the quality by three times, which, and you won't. And, and, and that's because that, that's then not loyalty. Even something like Apple, where people queue up outside to buy, used to queue up outside to buy phones, that's loyalty, seen as loyalty, but it's, it's really not. It's just wanting to see the status of what you're buying. Because instead of customer loyalty, we should really be talking about usefulness. Uh, you know, customers aren't loyal that customers do like to stay with the same companies that they find most useful and the companies that most usefully help them through their lives. Now, as long as you as an organization stay more useful than your competitors, then people will stay with you. Uh, and some of that use is uh, very uh, practical in terms of is the product useful, is the service useful. Some of that use is psychological. Um, so, you know, do people get trust and certainty from you? Some of it is status driven, like Apple. Do people, uh, you know, useful because actually, you know, having the latest iPhone helps to symbolize to other people what, what they're like and, uh, you know, that they're important. I, Rory Sutherland talks a lot about this, about the kind of different symbols that people are trying to, trying to shove. But it's all a different type of usefulness rather than loyalty. And the reason I think this matters is because 
I think language is important and organizations, if they do believe in customer loyalty, that actually leads them to make decisions presuming customers are loyal once they've joined them. And this is why organizations spend so much time focusing on onboarding and on the start of the experience. And let's make it really easy for people to join us, and that's great, but we'll make that experience great, and then they'll buy more. But then they spend very little time then keeping the experience great. And so people then gradually you know, disappear and go off. And you mentioned this earlier about endings as well. And a guy called Joe McLeod has written a brilliant book called Ends that I talk about in my book, about how organizations essentially just ignore endings uh, and they just let their customers go or even worse they make it really difficult for their customers to leave by putting them through this ringer of well we're going to give you all these offers or make you phone us up to leave and and what that means to your point about the peak end rule you just have a really bitter experience your last memory is really bitter so in a couple of years time when you come around to thinking about your reconsideration the bottom of your list rather than actually just kind of going, okay, you want to leave? We get it. We understand it happens. Thank you so much for being a customer. If you ever want to come back to us, we'll be right here. Here's my number. Give me a call. And then two years later, hey, you're top of the list again. But this is because this myth of loyalty exists where companies kind of believe that company, customers are going to join and they're going to love them so much, they're going to stay loyal to them forever and they're just going to stay. And it, and it, just, it just isn't true. It just isn't true. <laughs> it's, uh, it's funny that the, I was thinking about this while you're talking that so many companies that talk about loyalty, right, and that that's a big focus for them, something they care about and making it easy, like you said, but then they also have a huge commitment to stickiness and creating sticky, the sticky products is a thing that and services is something that people talk about, something you talk about in banking and things all the time, right, which is this, if, if loyalty when you take that step back, right, this going back to the inside out, outside in sort of thinking, go, okay, so if we believe that loyalty is a thing, and that's what we're building, then why do we care about stickiness? Like, mm. why yeah. would that even yeah. be a thing? How can we, you know, the sort of paradox of them both and how they don't really go together. But if you just have, like you said, so I guess, We'll, we'll let you put the bow on this statement to say, okay, so if, if not loyalty, then what? Right. Where it seems like, yeah, but how am I supposed to do anything other than this? If they're not loyal, then yeah, then stickiness matters. And I really should be cre- making it impossible to leave me. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's it because you, well, this kind of goes back to that point about the thick end of the wedge and really understanding what matters to people. Because if it's an organization uh, and as the leaders in an organization, you really understand what matters to people in their lives, then your job, your singular job, is to understand how you can be most useful to them in their life. And as long as you keep connected to what matters to customers and keep all of your focus on staying useful, then you don't need to worry about the, you know, are they loyal or how do I keep them trapped with us or how do I keep them sticky? Because you're just creating things that people want and want to use. And you're doing that in a human way, straightforward way. And so it becomes a a virtuous circle that sounds incredibly simple, I know, when I'm describing it that way. But but I do believe there's so much in organizations that is overcomplicated by people trying to be too clever almost and do so many different things and try and find lots of different tricks and ways to do things for people. But what's at the heart of great organizations is really understanding their customers and really staying useful to them. Now, as I say, what we tend to find is as uh, people, ironically, as people become more senior in their organizations, they just get further away from the customers. And, and you have this kind of odd um, situation where the people that are the decision makers and making the strategy are then now the people that are furthest away from the customers. And their colleagues that are closest to customers are very rarely involved in those decisions as well. So the whole thing just needs flipping around, you know, really, really flipping back on its head just so that because as soon as you have that customer connection the rest of it kind of happens naturally because you just see it and you feel it and it becomes so obvious what you need to do that you just do it it's a general it's a common sense thing i suppose i talk uh in the book about organizations are full of humans that aren't allowed to act in a human way and and i think that's really i think that's really at the heart of of everything i've tried to to say really that we're all humans. We all know how to be empathetic. No one needs to be taught how to be empathetic. You don't need empathy training in your organization. But when you walk through that door or you open up your laptop at nine o'clock in the morning, something happens and all these processes and policies and emails gets in the way and people just end up 
doing things that they wouldn't normally do. They end up writing things in a way they wouldn't write to their friends. They end up talking in a way that they wouldn't talk to their friends in the pub or a bar later on that night. And, and, and this is really at the heart of it. If you can retain that humanness to your organization and let your people be human, then they will understand customers. They will create things that are useful. And you, you, you can put to one side all of this part of stickiness or making things in a way that people have to use it because people just want to use your product. That was a long answer, wasn't it? I love a long answer. And it's a really, it's, it's an important one. And it's you know, good for people to be hearing. I was going to be asking about the, uh, I love the idea of like, we all kind of forget that we're humans when we start working. You know, it's the, you know, I talk, I use the, you know, writer elephant analogy, right? Where we forget we're elephants and we start lo- or, you know, lo- talking to writers all of a sudden when you get into, into your work space. And so how different it can be when you, um, remember, think about like, Hey, if I received this email, would I have any idea what it's talking about? And like you said, it's common sense stuff, but it takes effort to be more thoughtful about those sorts of things and to get out of your own way and to ask good questions. And again, knowing that the, you know, survey of are we like, if you were to rank your favorite service providers of this, are we at the top? And someone's like, yeah, I, sure. Right. But that's not how people think about anything. So it's a useless, what a waste of time. <laughs> yeah. And, and well, and time, I think time is the right word actually, because I think more than anything, it takes time. Uh, and I think, uh, organization i can you know i can talk from this from both sides of the fence having been in big organizations building a strategy and now kind of consulting with organizations of all, of all shapes and sizes everyone is just so busy you know like back-to-back meetings all of the time emails coming out there is all of the time and and i just think no one has time to think uh, no one has time to stop and think and it's really dangerous because we just get into this processing mindset of just ticking stuff off the to-do list and it's more important to get the stuff done rather than really think and do it well. And that's why I generally, and I've mentioned a couple, generally I try not to mention the companies that I've had bad experiences with when I write about them. Because generally I know that most of the people in those companies are trying to do the right thing and it's a systemic thing that's caused it. And actually people in the organization don't really even understand how it's how it's happened. There was a, an example from a few years ago, um, probably about 10 years ago now, at uh, one of the banks where they thought it was a nice idea to send a Christmas card to all of their customers that had taken a mortgage with them that year. Uh, and it was a really, it was a really lovely idea. So that you have to imagine this, but the Christmas card said, you know, thank you, Merry Christmas to all a hundred thousand of you who've taken a mortgage with us this year. And then it said, your home may be repossessed if you do not keep up repayments on your mortgage. Because they, they just put it, put it through, obviously in a rush, sent it out. The compliance statement had gone on it. And no one had checked it or stopped it. So customers receiving this get this message saying, Merry Christmas, have a great time, but don't spend too much. Because if you do, we're coming for your house. And and it was just such a brilliant example of no one, <laughs> everyone, everyone who looks at that can see what the problem is. Everyone. So the only, the only possible reason that happened is because people were too busy not to see it. And if you don't have that time and you don't have that time to step back and speak to your customers you don't have that time to step back and speak to your colleagues but you just don't have that time to stop and think you do just end up in that kind of busy full mentality and that's when bad customer experiences happen right no that's i uh i talked about this a little bit i did an episode on starbucks um like what i see in the behavioral economics uh kind of analysis of things they're doing that people can learn from i have one on costco and different stuff and Starbucks does really great stuff. And especially here in Seattle, we see a lot of that um, and things to keep people coming back and, and understanding it. And they also ask a lot to help personalize an experience. But there are some things they don't ask that make a really big difference for me as a person. I fe- they try to, when you try to make it look like you know the person you're talking to and you know everything about them and then you miss it feels a lot more painful and annoying than if you didn't ask enough, right, to be able to understand me. So I have celiac disease. I cannot have anything with gluten. And so it's a very limited amount of stuff that I can have. And they constantly are saying, well, if you get this sandwich, if you just get this donut, if you just get this bakery item, you say, like, 
I will never buy that. I will never get that item from you. No matter how much you try to press, like push your sandwiches on me, I'm never going to get one. So yeah. the only way I can earn bonus points is if you I buy something that's going to make me sick. Ridiculous, right? What a terrible situation. And similarly, I've had over the years, many vendors and partners and people that know know me and have known that I have this and can't eat gluten. And then the gift box arrives with cookies and other treats that I can't have. And you say like, well, good to know that you forgot about me. And yeah. it was something that was meant as a nice gesture that can go awry. When, and when when someone didn't know me, and they don't know, no, I get it. Most people don't have this problem. Okay, fine. But when I know it's someone that knows me, and then they send the thing and you kind of go, yeah, yeah. And how, how does that how does that make you feel? You know, it just makes it very clear that it it kind of when you get back to that loyalty piece, right, of like, well, clearly you don't know me as much as I thought you did. Right. And so if you kind of get this like, "Mm, I guess I don't matter to you as much as I thought. And then when the time comes to look for something else, maybe you look a little bit different. And again, I try not to fault people for it because I'm less common. But, you know, even in that way, one in from over, you know, 10 years ago when I got diagnosed, it was one in 133 people in the world has celiac disease. So it's not like (laughs) the, you know, the odds are so small that you're going to hit somebody that can't or doesn't eat the thing. So anyway, just sort of a simple thing that can make such, such a big difference. So, uh, I guess if, again, we talked about putting a bow on the thing, but if we look at this and you were to kind of summarize just why why you wrote the book, what companies should be learning from it, and um, why this is important. Yeah. Hopefully it's clear. So like I said, we're putting the, we're just doing the final knot in the bow, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's right. I mean, I think, you know, the, my view is that over the last 20 years, organizations have done a great job at kind of trying to perfect the functional customer experience. But they've done that at the expense of the emotional experience and the, and the human experience. And to be clear, this isn't just saying organizations need to have humans back in. I think you can have brilliant digital experiences, but they still need to have that humanity. And and I think I think what led me to write the book was I mean, there was a couple of reasons. One is that I you know, this this is what I've always done and I just find it hugely interesting. But more than that, I, I feel just incredibly strongly that these are people's lives being wasted on the telephone, you know, and, and dealing with problems. And I, I look around and I'm more probably aware of it than others because it's what I do as a job, but I see stress all the time. I see people that are trying to live good, happy lives where they want to spend time with their friends and family and go on holidays and have nice meals. And they have to spend an inordinate amount of time, you know, on the phone with companies. This, this thing at the moment where, you know, it feels like every time you phone a company, you're on hold for half an hour. And, and it just, to me, it just feels just fundamentally wrong, really. And I think, you know, organizations can do brilliant stuff in the world. When organizations are great, they're a great force for good. Businesses can have a huge impact on people's lives. And so I really want to see that. I really want organizations to take ownership and responsibility for that again and have a positive impact rather than a negative impact. And then I think the third part of that is I think it's more straightforward than people think it is. You know, so as I was thinking about the book and writing about the book, there's lots of different frameworks around customer experience and different things you can do. And, you know, you need to do these eight things or these 10 things. And I have a version of that in, in the book, I guess, and some of the things I'm suggesting. But at its heart, it's really just saying, just just be the human that you've spent all your life training to be. <laughs> and, you know, speak in a human way and use that human language and real words and think about what it's like to be on the other end and take the time to understand other people. And actually, if as an organization you do that, you'll be fine. You'll give a great experience, even if you don't have a perfect customer journey mapping approach or you don't do NPS, all these other things. If you just start from the principle of being a real normal person and thinking about what that human response might be, you'll be a long way. And so that that was really what's at the heart of the book and, and why I felt like I needed to get that out into the world. I love it. And it feels like the perfect, like... I guess cherry on top of our, I'm mixing metaphors and I feel good with it, but like it feels like mums and grands is the right like line of, uh, if you have the like 30 second version of mums and grands. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. AO.com in the, in the UK, white goods, uh, provider. Um, their CEO is called John Robertson is a real inspiration and his whole customer experience strategy is essentially that mums and grands. 
And he says to his team, uh, you know, treat everyone like you would want your grand to be treated. So whenever you're with a customer, treat them the way you would want someone to treat your grand if she was a customer. And any decision you make, because I have a very empowered team, any decision you make, just think about when you went home at night and sat down for dinner with your mum and told her what decisions you've made today, would she be proud of what you'd done? Did you make the right decision? And it's so simple. Treat people like you want your grand to be treated and make your mum proud with the decisions you make. And if you do that, you're going to create a great experience and you're going to build a great organization and you don't need much of the other stuff that goes around it. I love it. I think it's, like you said, so simple and relatable and and people really get that. And it can change the way we approach the human experience. And so for everyone who is now excited to go get their copy of the book to connect with you to learn more, what is their best path to do so? Yeah, listen, so the book's out February the 2nd in the UK, 4th of April in the USA, and then uh, Australia in May. Uh, I'm on Twitter at John J. Seals. Uh, I've got an Instagram account where I post lots of what I think are quite funny customer experience photos. That's uh, CX underscore stories. Um, and I have a sub stack as well, as, uh, as we all do nowadays, which is CX stories as well. And that's where I write regularly on the kind of things that uh, I, I talk about here and, and a few other kind of things about organizations and how they work too. So yeah, I, I'm generally all over the internet except for TikTok because I'm too old. Uh, me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, perfect. Well, we'll go ahead and uh, link to all that. And of course, to the human experience uh, so that people can go get their copy because I am sure they will be very excited to do so. It's full of stories like this. So many more. It's a really fun read. I highly recommend it. And thank you again, John, for joining me on the show. It was a lot of fun to chat with you today. Yeah, amazing. Thanks for having me on. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you again to John Sills for joining me on the show today. What got your brain buzzing in today's conversation? For me, I love so much about this. And I think my favorite thing is how it's all rooted in this weird phenomenon about how we get to work and forget that we're human, that we forget the way we like to be talked to and treated and somehow get into this really weird work mode that is way less effective than if we were to remember that we're humans working with other humans. Mums and Grands is a great example of this. And there are so many other examples throughout the book that showcase how easy it is for a brand to stand out and have stellar experience if they get a little more human. That doesn't mean shunning technology. It is about understanding behavior and treating people well. Simple, effective, and when you consider the extreme costs when you have to fix things or have long calls and hold times and back and forth and returns and complaints, it's awesome to know that it's often more cost effective to just do it right and more human the first time. I love this message so much and hope it resonates with you too. Do you have an example of a time you were blown away by great customer service or other great experiences with a brand? What about a shockingly poor example? I bet we have more of those, unfortunately. Share it with me and John on social media, whatever it is. You're going to find me as The Brainy Biz pretty much everywhere and as Melina Palmer on LinkedIn. John is John J. Sills on Twitter, and we will link to all that in the show notes, as well as John's book, The Human Experience, and other related books and past episodes. It's all waiting for you in the app you're listening to and at thebrainybusiness.com slash 277. And thank you again to John Sills for joining me on the show today. It was a delight to chat with and learn from you. Join me Tuesday for another Brainy episode of the Brainy Business Podcast. It's going to be a lot of fun. You won't want to miss it. Until then, thanks again for listening and learning with me. And remember to be thoughtful. Thank you for listening to the Brainy Business Podcast. Melina offers virtual strategy sessions, workshops, and other services to help businesses be more brain friendly. For more free resources, visit thebrainybusiness.com.